Hello, Mark here. Before we begin today's episode, I would just like to quickly take the time to ask all of those who are enjoying the series a favour. If the platform you use to listen to Castings for Ancient Greece has a rating or review system, I would be extremely grateful if you would consider leaving the series a quick review. These ratings and reviews go a long way into helping others discover the show, in turn helping it grow. So if you enjoy the series and can spare a few minutes, I would love to read what you have to say about your experiences with the show. Thanks everyone for your support, and let's get to today's episode. But the Athenians, aware that their dismissal did not proceed from the more honourable reason of the two, went away deeply offended, and conscious of having done nothing to merit such treatment from the Spartans, and the instant they returned home they broke off the alliance which had been made against the Mede, and allied themselves with Sparta's enemy, Argos. Thucydides Hello, I'm Mark Selleck and welcome back to Casting Through Ancient Greece, Episode 59, From Allies to Enemies. Back at 481 BC, Sparta and Athens had united in what became to be known as the Hellenic League, with 29 other Greek city-states. This had been a response to the threat of Xerxes' invasion of Greece that would take place the next year. We had seen that the independent nature of the polis systems in Greece would see each city with their own interests they were looking to advance. Because of this, it was common for tensions to exist between many of the city-states, where wars between the Greek polis were more common than with peoples outside of Greece. Suspicions had existed between Sparta and Athens before the Persian Wars, where we had seen Sparta became involved in Athenian political troubles, with a Spartan force even having occupied the Acropolis. Though with the threat on the scale that was building up within the Persian Empire, Sparta and Athens, along with 29 other polis, would find themselves united over a common enemy. Through Xerxes' campaign in Greece, the Hellenic League would act together in defending Greek lands. However, even with Xerxes as a common enemy, the interests and suspicions of both Athens and Sparta would come to the surface on occasion, almost seeing the League break apart, though it would hold long enough to see the Persian forces defeated in Greek lands. With the Persians defeated in Greece, and the campaign now being taken into Persian controlled territories, the various interests of the Hellenic League members would once again come back to the forefront of their calculations. The contrast in interests would be most dramatic between Sparta and Athens. Athens wanted to continue the campaign in the eastern Aegean against Persia, while Sparta wanted to focus on stabilising and further their interests within Greek lands. Eventually, matters would come to a head where Athens and those cities and islands aligned with their interests would come to form the Delian League. As the years passed, both cities would pursue their own interests, with suspicions increasing, especially, as Thucydides tells us, with Sparta seeing the growing power of Athens. Though we would hear that the relations between the two largest powers on the mainland would remain amicable, even though there had been factions within both wanting to take a more aggressive approach to their interpolis relations. However, nearly 20 years after the Persian defeat, events and changes in the political landscape in both cities would see Athenian-Spartan relations turn openly hostile. This episode, now that we have looked at politically what had changed in Athens, we are going to turn to the interpolis relations that were now developing in the wake of the growing aggression and changes in Athenian policy. Here we will see Athens realigning their alliances with other Greek city-states to deal with the hostile nature that had developed between themselves and Sparta. Up until now, we had seen Athens focused on campaigns throughout the Aegean as they increased in wealth and power. However, they would also be focused on increasing this influence on the mainland. The actions that Athens would take within Greek lands would also see Sparta respond, looking to counter and develop their own influence further. This period is often referred to as the First Peloponnesian War and would culminate in Athens and Sparta facing one another at the Battle of Tanagra. In the sources that we have, it appears that the insult to Athens by Sparta for sending the Athenians home when they came to assist in the crisis of the Helot Revolt is the point where we see open hostility come to the surface. It would be in the face of this reality and the political shift that had occurred in Athens, where they now looked to reshape the alliances that were held within Greek lands. Previously, the alliances and agreements that Athens had made were in response to the Persian threats, with the Hellenic League being formed with Sparta and 29 other city-states due to the threat of Xerxes' invasion. We had seen with the formation of this league, many city-states would put aside their differences for the time being, so as to focus on this common enemy to all. The other major alliance group that the Athenians would be involved in would be the Delian League, which had also begun as a measure to combat further Persian aggression 
after Xerxes' invasions had been defeated. The Delian League would be formed separate from the Hellenic League, as the geopolitical realities had changed and the interests of the two major powers were not aligned now that the common enemy had been pushed from Greek lands. This would for a while see both leagues in existence, serving different functions. Athens, though, would insert more of their time and energy into the Delian League since it served the current situation. Even though suspicions and tensions had been growing between the two, the Hellenic League would be maintained and they would still manage to coexist under peaceful conditions. However, with the secret Spartan agreement to invade Attica during the Thassos campaign and then the rejection of Athenian assistance, this would all change. It would appear that Sparta in their time of crisis had called upon the agreements that had been made and saw the formation of the Delian League. This would have seen Sparta and Athens both bound by what had been agreed upon there. However, we had seen that there had been some resistance to fulfilling this alliance, with Ephialdes making the argument not to assist Sparta. Though due to Cimon's popularity, Athens would march off to help and fulfil their oath within the Hellenic alliance. It seems that this was one of the first times since the Persian defeat that the Hellenic alliance would be called upon to assist a member in a conflict. Athens, it appears, since forming the Delian League, had treated the Hellenic League of secondary importance. It may even be possible that there were those in Athens arguing that the League was now redundant, particularly Ephiotes and his faction. However, with the insult received by Athens, this would be the last action of help that they would provide within the context of the Hellenic League. We hear from Thucydides. They were deeply offended, considering that this was not the sort of treatment that they deserved from Sparta. And, as soon as they had returned, they denounced the original treaty of alliance which had been made against the Persians. This basically saw Athens having dissolved their membership in the Hellenic League. Even though the incident in Sparta is seen as a reason for this, I can't but help think that the change in Athenian politics would have eventually led to the same outcome by itself. But in this instance, it would have been a contributing factor also. This now saw Athens with only the Delian League. However, they would also move to establish alliances on the mainland to contend with the hostility existing between them and Sparta. We hear that straight after dissolving their membership in the Hellenic League, Athens would then move to create alliances with two city-states that had not been members within the League. This would be with Argos, who had been a long-time rival of Sparta. As we have seen, they were competing with the Spartans for dominance on the Peloponnese during the Archaic period. Then during the Persian invasions, they would appear to provide Persia with some level of assistance, though the context of this assistance appears to be due to their dislike of Sparta. Finally, we then saw Argos had begun to stir up some trouble for Sparta on the Peloponnese during the 470s, with the rise of a democratic faction, apparently with assistance coming from Athens in the form of Themistocles. Now though, Athens was taking official measures to ally themselves with one of Sparta's biggest opponents on the Peloponnese. The Thucydides would also tell us, at the same time that this alliance was being made with Argos, the same terms were also arranged with Thessaly. As we saw, Thessaly had not been a member of the Hellenic League, though they had attempted to gain assistance from them, but when the failed defence at the Tempe Pass took place, they had no choice but to Medize during the Persian invasions, since this would be one of the first regions the Persians would march into. We also saw in the 470s that a Spartan force under the command of Leotigides would campaign against Thessaly under the pretext of punishing the region for Medizing. Spreading Spartan influence through Greek lands appears to have been the real motive, though the campaign seems to have fizzled out with Leotigides' corruption taking place there. This earlier activity had perhaps shown the Spartans' hand with their intentions in the region north of Attica, and now Athens took measures to disrupt further attempts at spreading Spartan influence into these lands. Another alliance that Athens made around this point was with Apollos that had been part of the Peloponnesian League. Megara was located on the northern end of the Corinthian Isthmus, whereas Corinth was on the southern end. These two city-states had been engaged in a border dispute, which saw a war break out between the two. You may remember that Corinth was also a member of the Peloponnesian League. Although both were members of the same League, they only held an alliance with Sparta, and were free to conduct their other interpolis relations as they saw fit. In this war between Megara and Corinth, it appears Megara was getting the worst of it, and not only that, they recognised Corinth held an influential position with Sparta, so they would not likely receive any help from them. For this reason, they then turned to Athens for assistance, who were fully aware of the strategic importance of having Megara within their camp. Also, we had seen that Megara had been on hostile terms with Athens since the time of Chilon, 
who had attempted to enact a tyranny in Athens during 632 BC. He had help from his father-in-law, who was a tyrant of Megara at the time, and had provided him troops. It had appeared during Chilon's failed coup, many of the Megarian troops were killed, causing bad blood between the two cities. This enmity between the two would also see Megara come to be a member of the Peloponnesian League to provide some protection to her position. Though with the new realities now facing Megara, Athens was prepared to take advantage and shore up her own position in the face of Spartan aggression. The Isthmus of Corinth was the only land route for an army to march out of or into the Peloponnese, with it also the only land route for trade. Whoever was on friendly terms with the Polis that controlled the exits of the Isthmus would have an advantage of traversing their armies unhindered. Previously, Sparta had the advantage with access from the Peloponnese and into Attica, but this shift in alliance would see this advantage removed. This would now allow Athens to prepare to defend against any land movements from Sparta before it was able to exit the Isthmus. Megara sat right on the route an army would need to take. The bottom coastline was less rugged and from Megara extended a plain. It would be in this plain that Athens would also turn their attention to. In the process of helping Megara defend themselves against Corinth, they would construct a wall from Megara into the plains to a place called Nicaea. This would see that the most viable route off of the Isthmus was now controlled by Athens. In effect, the situation for both Athens and Sparta regarding the Isthmus was now a stalemate, but for Athens a much better situation than what was in effect before the shift in alliance. We also hear through Thucydides that Athens' interference in this dispute between Corinth and Megara would see the Corinthians conceive a bitter hatred for Athens. So these would be some of the major shifts diplomatically for Athens that we would see take place from the fallout of the breakdown in relations with Sparta. Though this would not be the only manoeuvring that Athens would take, they were also looking to continue to spread their influence, which would now start to take the shape on the mainland through campaigns. However, Athens would also continue its campaigning abroad, which I want to quickly touch on, but will be the main focus of our next episode. We had previously seen that the Delian League had been involved in campaigning on the island of Cyprus in 478 BC, just after the defeat of Xerxes' forces. Now though, 18 years on, we would once again hear that Athens and their allies were directing efforts against the island. The reason for the campaigns is not explained, but we know of it due to it being mentioned in the context of a much larger expedition that was about to take shape. This would be the Egyptian campaign, and it would be seen as a campaign of opportunity presenting itself. It is thought unlikely that Athens would have planned such a campaign with the conflict developing with Sparta on the mainland, but were responding to events where they saw an advantage could be gained. We will speak more on this point next episode. Egypt was still part of the Persian Empire, and as we have followed events in Persia, we have seen that the region of Egypt would revolt on occasion. We would find that during this time, a revolt would once again break out. This time, a Libyan king named Inaros would lead the revolt that would quickly spread throughout Egypt. Inaros would seek help from the Athenians and their Delian League, probably aware of the successful campaigns that they had directed against the Persians in previous years. For Athens, this presented another opportunity to interfere with Persian influence around the Mediterranean, and Thucydides would write, The Athenians happened to be engaged in a campaign against Cyprus with 200 ships of their own and of their allies. They abandoned this campaign, came to Egypt, and sailed up the Nile. This would be the opening of what would become a nearly six-year commitment and would turn out to be a disastrous affair for the Athenians. However, we will be focusing on the Egyptian campaign next episode. I just wanted to highlight it taking place here, as it would be unfolding while the conflict on the Greek mainland was also taking place. So let's now head back to the mainland to see what campaigns were developing there. Once again, I want to point out that Thucydides' account is very brief around these campaigns on the Greek mainland, and their chronology is not completely certain. Nevertheless, we will follow along with how he lays them out, and from his account, the first seems to align with events developing in Egypt. This seeing us look at a date of 460 as an estimate of these campaigns beginning. Though we are aware that all of these campaigns were taking place very close to one another, due to an inscription in Athens celebrating the sacrifice the fallen had made in each of these following campaigns. It would appear that the first battles on the Greek mainland involving Athens would take place on the Peloponnese, as well as just off the coast. It would seem that Athens was looking to establish a way of opening up a better connection with their recent allies, the Argives. Remember here that Corinth controlled the southern end of the Isthmus into the Peloponnese, so a land connection was out of the question. 
if they were going to maintain their alliance with Argos, a base would need to be established on the coast of the Peloponnese that would provide a secure sea connection to Athens, where they would then be able to maintain a land one to Argos. On the episode page I'll put up a map and try and outline visually where these battles that I mentioned today would take place, but just keep in mind not all of the locations are certain. Athens would send a fleet of unknown size to land on the southern tip of the Argolid Peninsula, where they would land at a place called Helaeus. Now obviously, Corinth would not be too happy with Athenian troops landing on the Peloponnese behind them, especially after having assisted their enemy, Megara. Another city-state that was not too pleased with the appearance of Athenian soldiers was that of the polis Epidaurus, who were located about midway up the Argolid Peninsula on the eastern shore. Both Corinth and Epidaurus were joined forces, with it seeming a land force was sent down the peninsula to meet the Athenians. A land battle would occur at Helaeus, where the Athenians were defeated. It's unclear what this meant for the Athenians in the region, but they may well have remained, as some have thought that this is where they had gained influence in Trozen, not far away, that later down the track would be shown to be controlled by Athens. The argument here is that this campaign appears to be the best opportunity for them to have gained this control, in absence of anything else in the sources. However, this is not the only battle that would take place. The navies of the combatants would also engage off the coast of Epidaurus, near the island of Sacrophilia, where this time around the Athenians would be victorious. This would see that Athens was still able to maintain its sea connection to whatever had remained on land. It may well have been this campaign on the Argolid that saw the island of Aegina recommence their hostilities with Athens. As we have seen, Athens and Aegina had developed hostilities due to sea trade during the Archaic period. Then when the Hellenic League was formed, they put their differences aside to focus on a common enemy. But with the Persians defeated, Aegina now saw Athens more of a threat. They may have formed an alliance with both Corinth and Epidaurus, as their campaign was shaping up on the Peloponnese, or maybe in the wake of their victory at Helaeus. Also, there may have been a larger support base with perhaps the Peloponnesian League providing support due to the assistance that they would provide Sparta during the Helot Revolt. Aegina was just east of where the naval battle had been fought, and it seems they were now responding to the threat Athens posed in their victory. This would see what is described by Thucydides as a great sea battle developing. We hear that both sides would be aided by their allies, though they are not named. Presumably this would be those members of the Delian League for Athens, and perhaps surviving ships from Corinth and Epidaurus, or other Peloponnesian League members. In this naval engagement, the Athenians would also be victorious, with us hearing that they would capture some 70 ships, showing that this naval engagement was on par with some of the previous battles that we have covered. With the navy of Aegina defeated, the Athenians would then land on the island and proceed to lay siege to the city. We hear here too that the Peloponnesians would send aid to the besieged city in the form of 300 hoplites. Again, we are unsure of who they were, but only that they were described as Peloponnesians. According to Diodorus, the campaign against Aegina would last some nine months. The help that the Peloponnesians sent would all be in vain, as Athens was able to force Aegina into surrender. They would force them into the Delian League as a tribute paying member, while also confiscating their fleet and tearing down their city walls. While the siege on Aegina had been continuing, Corinth had observed that this was the perfect opportunity to launch an attack on Megara. The rationale here was that Athens, not only engaged on Aegina, was also engaged over in Egypt. This they thought would see the Athenians too far stretched to deal with another conflict. In the war with Megara, the Corinthians had occupied the Grenier Mountains on the Isthmus, where they probably had a great view of the defensive wall that had been built in the plains below. The Corinthians with their allies would descend from these mountains to mount their attack, though Athens would be prepared to meet this attack with us hearing rather than breaking the siege on Aegina to deal with a the threat, they would raise a new army in Athens drawn from old and young men. These would have been from the age groups not considered to be of military age. The result of the battle was perhaps somewhat inconclusive, as both sides would claim victory, though Thucydides says that perhaps the Athenians held the advantage, as it was they who were able to erect a trophy on the field of battle. This was usually the sign of a side being victorious, as they still had control of the field of battle. Though a follow-up action by the Corinthians would make no doubt that the Athenians were the victors in this case. Some twelve days later, the Corinthian forces returned near the site of the battlefield, where a party was sent out to erect their own trophy. Word had made it to the Athenians in Megara of the Corinthians in the area, and they would rush out of the city to meet the invaders. 
they would fall upon the party that had been tasked with the trophy, destroying them. A larger engagement would then develop, with the rest of the Corinthian forces getting involved. In this struggle, the Corinthian army were defeated, and the survivors retreated. We then hear that the Corinthians would suffer another blow, where a division of the retreating army would get lost in the panic, and would find themselves trapped and cut off from the main force. This would be one of the first times we hear of troops other than hoplites responsible for victory. The Athenian hoplites would block the Corinthian retreat, while the light troops of the army would stone those caught in the trap destroying the division. We also find it reported in the sources that Athens would begin another construction project, though it is difficult to know exactly when it began. This project would be a response to the conflict with Sparta, and perhaps an extension of the policies that were taking place with the walls around Megara. They would begin construction on what is known as their Long Walls, which would connect the city of Athens to its ports, the Piraeus and Pharaon, over five kilometres away. The idea here was to protect the city from the hotline armies that had come to dominate Greek warfare. The main strategy in defending a well-fortified city was to cut it off and starve the inhabitants into surrender. Though Athens would effectively turn herself into an island within the mainland and then rely on one aspect she held dominance in, her navy. By having the ports within this defensive wall, the navy would ensure that the city would remain fed, even if besieged by an enemy, while the fighting ships of the navy would secure the trade routes relied upon. Although it appears that these walls were starting to be built by around 460, they would not be completed until after the first phase in this Athenian-Spartan conflict. Have you been enjoying the series and thinking of helping support the show in some way? Casting Through Ancient Greece is over on Patreon, where we have been providing supporters with monthly bonus episodes where we look at past topics in more detail in isolation. So far we have revisited the Bronze Age of Greece, looking at art, trade connections, warfare, and a number of other topics. We then advanced into the Archaic Period, where we then spent some time exploring the little known Lalatine War, the Olympic Games, Emergence of the Hoplite, and other areas. This then saw us turning to do a three-part series on the epic poet Homer where we also explore the two epic poems, the Iliad and the Odyssey, that are credited to him. Currently, we are exploring the development of both Sparta and Athens in more detail. We have recently dealt with the origin myths of both of these city-states. We are now about to look a little deeper into the influential figures from both Athens and Sparta in their early histories. We will be first looking at Lycurgus, the lawgiver of Sparta, before we then move on to Solon of Athens. If you are interested in gaining access to these bonus episodes, please consider heading over to the Casting Through Ancient Greece Patreon page. Not only will you get monthly bonus episodes, but you will receive early access, ad-free episodes, plus video series updates about what's happening in the series, what's planned, and we also run competitions. Other options also include access to fully referenced transcripts of the series episodes, as well as a forum where members' questions are answered every month via video. Alternatively, you can visit the Casting Through Ancient Greece website where you can find the Patreon link, as well as other ways that help the series grow when clicking on the support the series button. Thank you all for listening to the series, and I look forward to perhaps seeing you over on Patreon. So, we can see that the Athenians had been very busy within Greece and overseas from around 460, though one thing you might have noticed is that Sparta had not become involved in any of the campaigns. Some have tried to explain Sparta's inaction through other events such as the Helot Revolt dragging on and being tied up with that. While the historian Donald Kagan puts forward that political manoeuvrings in Sparta were continuing, where perhaps the war party no longer had the influence they had when dismissing the Athenians. Though he also admits that this is pure speculation. However, this would all change as Sparta was now in a position where she needed to act. She was technically in an undeclared war that had yet turned hot but Athens was now at war with three of her most important allies. We had seen that Sparta was quite willing to attack Attica during the Thassos campaign, but now the situation had changed. The land route that they would use to attack Athenian territory was now controlled by Athens at the northern end, though an opportunity would present itself in a small war that would develop across the Gulf of Corinth and in a region near Thermopylae. This would see Sparta, instead of sailing an army against Athens directly, where they would have been at a disadvantage now that Athens also held ports across from Megara on the Gulf side, they would come up to the assistance of an ally in the face of an aggressor. The Phacaeans had attacked the city of Doris, the ancestral home of the Dorian Spartans, as seen in the tradition. The Phacaeans seemed to be getting the upper hand in the war until the Spartans intervened on Doris's side. 
Back in Sparta, the king Plastarchus, who Pausanias had been the regent for, had recently died. Without an heir, it would be Pausanias' son, Plastianax, who would continue the royal line. He too was too young to rule in his own right, and had a regent, being Nicomedes. It was Nicomedes who would lead the Spartan expedition to aid the city of Doris with 1,500 hoplites and another 10,000 Peloponnesian hoplites. As you can see, these were the sorts of numbers that would be sent to face large armies, and perhaps seems like a bit of an overkill for a regional conflict. This was almost certainly due to the fact that Sparta's true intentions lay in Attica, though there is another possibility we will get to in a second. The Spartan-led force was that large that when approaching Doris, it appears that a battle would not be fought, and the Phacaeans were compelled by the numbers bearing down on them to restore what they had taken with conditions also laid upon them. However, before we settle on these lines of thinking of what Sparta may have been up to, there is also another possibility that highlights Sparta's own diplomatic manoeuvrings, though we need to look to Diodorus who is our only source on this. He does present this diplomatic exchange taking place after the Battle of Tanagra, which we are getting to, but it would make much more sense if they were occurring previous to this also. As we have seen, some confusion in chronology has been a feature of some areas in Diodorus's work before. The polis of Thebes was one of the largest city-states located in Boeotia. Like Athens, they had had ambitions of uniting the many villages and the small estates around them, under their leadership of course. Though they had yet been unsuccessful in this objective, and had only regional coalitions form when it was to everyone's advantage. Their policies would continue to see that the smaller cities being targeted, where the goal was to spread Theban influence. Though many of the smaller cities saw this as a threat, and would turn to others for help. Athens boarded Boeotia and would interfere in Thebes' ambitions, with their assistance in the past to the polis of Plataea being a very clear example of this taking place. Athens' assistance is what saw the Plataeans coming to the Athenians' aid before the Battle of Marathon. We have seen throughout our journey that Athens and Thebes were often on the opposite side during regional conflicts, as well as the Persian Wars. Sharing a border, Athens found its best interests rested in an ununited Boeotia. So with this in mind, Diodorus tells us that Thebes would approach Sparta with a proposition that would be to the advantage of both cities. He would write, The Thebans asked the Lacedaemonians to aid them in winning for their city the hegemony over all of Boeotia. And they promised that in return for this favour, they would make war by themselves upon the Athenians, so that it would no longer be necessary for the Spartans to lead troops beyond the borders of the Peloponnese. Obviously for Thebes, if this was successful, they would end up with their united Boeotia under their leadership. For Sparta, this would have been an attractive proposition, as we have seen they were not fond of sending their armies out of the Peloponnese. Not only this, if Boeotia united, it would provide a counterweight to the growing strength of Athens. This would also help explain the size of the Spartan army that went into Boeotia, and would also give another explanation of why Athens marched out to meet them. Though it is unclear if Athens was aware of this agreement, attempting to disrupt the campaign, or were they acting due to perceived direct threats on their borders. Anyway, this is just another bit of food for thought on why Sparta, on what Sparta may have been up to in Boeotia. Though as we will see, it doesn't really explain what is to follow with Sparta supposedly looking to head home after their short expedition in Doris. But it would make sense later with events in Boeotia after the Battle of Tanagra, which we will cover in a couple of episodes' time. Like always, we need to keep in mind that we are missing a lot of detail around this point in Greek history. It would be here that we perhaps see Sparta's true intention. Thucydides would tell us that Sparta had received information that Athens was going to hinder their passage back home, which would cause the Spartans to remain in Boeotia. Though how motivated they were to head home after their short campaign is questionable, given the army they sent was more in line with facing another large Greek power. What can be found in the sources can perhaps lead us to two different lines of thinking here. The first would see Sparta looking to head back to the Peloponnese, though with the Athenians' control of the northern end of the Isthmus and moving to contest the sea route, would see Sparta waited out for a safe passage home. Also in this interpretation, other opportunities would present themselves to the Spartans while seeing the Athenians move against the Spartans while they were trapped in Boeotia. The other sees Sparta with a more aggressive mindset, where their intention had been to attack Athens from a more vulnerable position, and perhaps the opportunities that arose were more calculated. Though just keep in mind, as we follow events, 
Either of these two could be what took place, or the line of intent may have crossed both possibilities to varying degrees. Though I think we also need to keep in mind what Diodorus says about the diplomatic talks that may have been going on with Thebes. The opportunity that we hear of arising, according to Thucydides, was through a treasonous plot being hatched in Athens. We had seen that certain elements in Athens despised the new policies and reforms taking place there, so much so that the man who paved the way was assassinated. Now it appears that a large effort was being made to attempt to overthrow the democracy. Thucydides writing in regards to the Spartans remaining in Boeotia says, Secret encouragement had been given to them by a party in Athens, who hoped to put an end to the reign of democracy and the building of the Long Walls. At this point, we now find Athens would move into action against the Spartans, still north of Attica. It would be the Athenians who would take the fight to the Spartans. Perhaps they saw their retreat home was cut off, and they wanted to finish the army in the field, so it wouldn't pose a threat to them from the north. Another possibility is that the Athenians, aware of the treason brewing within Athens, were looking to quickly engage the Spartans away from Attic territory, where the conspirators within Athens would have less of an effect. What it should come as no surprise for this period is that the details in this battle are very few and far between. But between Thucydides, Diodorus, and even Plutarch, we will try and get an understanding of what was taking place. Whatever the reasons, motivations, and intent around these events were, we would find that some 14,000 hoplites would march north. This would be the entire levy of Athenians, also including a thousand men from Argos, as well as a contingent of cavalry from Thessaly. Diodorus also says that there would be 50 ships that would also be sent out, this presumably being a fleet to block Spartan movements in the Gulf of Corinth. The Spartan and Athenian forces would end up meeting at the polis of Tanagra, located within Boeotia, towards the eastern coast. Diodorus would provide some extra details around this meeting, writing that originally the Athenians were occupying the passes in the mountains on the Corinthian Isthmus, though the Spartans would be made aware of this, which saw them march back into Boeotia, where the Athenians would finally catch up with them at Tanagra. Both armies would form up in lines of battle across from one another. Where we hear, the fight that would take place was hard fought with many falling on either side. It appears during the battle, a crisis took place that saw the condition of Thessalian cavalry desert to the Spartans. The reason for this and their impact on the battle was unclear in Thucydides' account. However, according to Diodorus, this first day would not be the end of the battle, with both sides making camp after the first day was brought to an end by the fading light. Diodorus would then suggest that the cavalry had switched sides on the first day, though unknown to the Athenians. The next day a supply train was making its way to the Athenians, and it would be this target that the cavalry would attack. Initially the Athenians were still under the impression that the Thessalians were allies, though this mistake would be realised after welcoming the men and many men were slain, accompanying the supply train. He would then tell us that the Athenian army in camp would respond to the Thessalian attack, where they were able to rout them. Though this would also see the Spartan forces responding, which would see a pitched battle take place. Diodorus would report that both sides would claim victory and that the battle would be seen as a tie. Though according to Thucydides and Plutarch, it would be the Spartans who would be victorious in the battle of Tanagra. It doesn't seem this was a crushing victory with a full-blown rout taking place, but rather the Athenians appear to have been withdrawn from the field in good order, nevertheless leaving the Spartans in control of the battlefield. Another interesting development is also reported by Plutarch as having taken place at Tanagra, which caused some consternation amongst the Athenian ranks. Apparently Chiron had turned up to the battle in full armour and attempted to join the ranks of his tribe. The Athenians were concerned at his appearance at the battle so soon after his ostracism. It was thought his presence would disorder the army and perhaps the talk of treasonous manoeuvrings occurring in Athens would be connected to his appearance here. The Athenians would not end up receiving him into their ranks, but Chiron would then depart. Perhaps he had been made aware of the plot that was developing in Athens which, if it was, would have most probably come from within those who had been amongst his supporters. He may have been showing that he was not involved in whatever was brewing and potentially sending a message to his supporters. As for when he was sent away, he would assemble the supporters he had in Athens, where Plutarch would write, who were most suspected as favouring the Lacedaemonians, to behave themselves bravely against their enemies, and by their actions make their innocence evident to their countrymen. Apparently they took this advice and would form together in a unit when the battle took place. 
where they would then be cut off in their attempts to show their devotion to Athens. They would then achieve in highlighting their innocence to their fellow Athenians, though it would cost them all their lives. So it is a little hard to make out what really took place here. Thucydides is very vague on the details of what was taking place, while Diodorus was writing 400 years later and Plutarch provides us some anecdotes. Though when it comes to who came out on top, I am more inclined to go with what Thucydides says. For after the battle, the Spartan force was able to march back home through the Corinthian Isthmus, this seeming to fall in line with the Athenians being in no position to oppose their march at this stage. So it is here at the end of the Battle of Tanagra that we will end our episode today. I had planned to cover the entire war and the peace arrangement that would result, but as this episode developed it was clear that this was a little too ambitious. We also didn't get to the question of how this conflict should be viewed in the context of what would develop later, but we will deal with this when we look at the conclusion of the war and what followed. As we saw this episode, the conflict that would develop, otherwise called the First Peloponnesian War, doesn't appear to have been formally declared. Its beginnings would be in 460, but we wouldn't see Sparta become involved directly until 457 in Boeotia, that would lead to the Battle of Tanagra. Initially Athens had been appearing to manoeuvre in a way to protect itself from Spartan aggression, by securing allies and the security of their position, by focusing on some of Sparta's fiercest rivals and also their strongest allies. We would also see that they would protect themselves from a land incursion coming overland from the Peloponnese with a new alliance with Megara. Though the regions north of Attica would prove to still be a back door if an army could be landed via an overseas route. Athens would realise this and would begin construction on their long walls to force her enemies into besieging the city. Though the strength of the Athenian navy would see resupply would not be an issue. We then saw Sparta could not ignore the activities Athens was engaging in and would begin operating in Boeotia. Here we saw it isn't entirely clear what their motivations and intent were, though we covered some possibilities from what can be found in the sources. Whatever this was, Athens would end up marching an army out and engaging the Spartan led forces, which would result in what was arguably a Spartan victory, though not all the sources agree on this. However, the result of the engagement at Tanagra would see that the Spartans would be able to return home through the contested isthmus of Corinth. After our next episode, we will be picking back up from the Spartans return to the Peloponnese, where we will see the engagements that would continue to take place in Boeotia with Athens campaigning there. The Theban agreement with Sparta we spoke of this episode will make some more sense in this context of these battles, though how long the agreement had been running is something we will try and shed some more light on. We will also find a peace agreement coming into effect between Athens and Sparta that we'll also turn to and what this meant for the immediate future. However, next episode we'll be turning to the overseas campaigns that had been developing in tandem with what had been occurring on the mainland for this period. Here we will be focused on the Athenians' involvement in Cyprus, though much more of our focus will be on the Egyptian campaign that would develop. This would be as a result of events taking place within the Persian Empire, with the Persian-controlled region of Egypt breaking out in revolt. The leader of the revolt, a Libyan king, would seek Athenian help for shaking off the Persian yoke. The Athenians who had been so effective in campaigning against areas of Persian influence would come to the rebels' aid, but it would appear this time around they would overextend themselves and be on the receiving end of a disastrous campaign. Thank you everyone for your continued support and a big shout out to all those who have found some value in the series and have been supporting you on Patreon and other various ways. Your contribution has truly helped me grow the series. If you have also found some value in the show and wish to support the series, you can head to www.castingthroughancientgreece.com and click on the support the series button, where you can discover many ways to extend your support to helping the series grow. Be sure to stay connected and updated on what's happening in the series and join me over on Facebook or Instagram at Casting Through Ancient Greece or on Twitter at Casting Greece. And be sure to subscribe to the series over at the Casting Through Ancient Greece website. I hope you can join me next time when we continue the narrative in the series with episode 60, Disaster on the Nile.